Hi guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thank you so much for joining me now today. We're going to be looking at the last of the approaches into memory and we've saved the certainly the most wacky for last. This is the psychodynamic approach to memory. So really this is Freud's thought about what memory is and how it can be explained. So there's lots to say here, so let's just dive right in. If we think in terms of id, ego and superego, remember this is basically what Freud's entire theories about psychology are based around, then we can imagine that memory must obey these rules. So memory must be, similar to all behaviour, an interaction between the conscious and the unconscious mind. So as a quick bit of revision, the ego, that's I in Latin, the ego is you, so that's your conscious mind. The id and the superego, that's your unconscious mind. That's the little devil and the little angel on your shoulder, respectively, fighting over what kind of behaviour you exhibit. In terms of memory, Freud would argue that things that you can actively remember are stored very much in the ego. They're stored very much in the conscious mind. Now, he hasn't got very much to tell us about how they are stored or why they are stored there. To him, that's good enough. He just reckons that... Memories that you consciously think about, how to ride a bike or um, what you had for dinner last night, those are stored in the ego. If you like, we can compare this a bit to work in memory. You can manipulate these memories, you can store them, you can retrieve them, you can do various things to them. That's your conscious mind. What Freud's more interested in, however, are the things which are not in the conscious mind. He believes that forgetting should be where we are focusing our efforts, where we're focusing our, re our research here. So Freud believes that things are forgotten for a reason. It's not that you gradually uh, start not rehearsing them, it's nothing to do with brain damage or anything like any of the other approaches would mention, no. What he believes is that things are forgotten because they are harmful. These are things that your brain does not want to remember because they're going to do you some psychological harm. Freud would call this repression and the idea here is that he pushes these memories deep down into your unconscious. Now just because we're pushing these memories down into our unconscious doesn't mean that they don't exist anymore. They are not truly forgotten. The best way to think about this is uh, if you imagine yourself in a swimming pool or you're in the sea and you're trying desperately to keep a beach ball or something inflatable underwater. Now you can do it, but it's really, really tough and it constantly wants to pop back up. And if you let it go, it's going to pop straight out the surface and it's going to come to the, uh, the forefront of your mind. What Freud believes here is that memories are pushed deep down into your id, but that they sometimes bubble up. Some of these little instances of the memory might come to the front and that's what sometimes dictates your behaviour. Is there any evidence for repression? Do people start forgetting things just because they think it's going to be psychologically harmful or their mind thinks that it's going to be psychologically harmful? Well yes there is actually. These uh, rather nifty psychologists in the 1960s, Levenger and Clark, very interesting experiment where they gave people a list of words and they asked them to make some associations with them. So, for example, if I gave you the word fire, you might say hot, flame, uh, warm. You might say red or something like that, smoke, something like that. Now, what Levinger and Clark say, or what they, they prove, point out here, is that if you were given a word which is negative, something like fight or knife or blood, then you're asked to make the associations to that. A little bit later on, if you come back and Levinger and Clark asks you, do you remember those words? Do you remember that word fight that we asked you about? What associations did you actually make? Turns out people can't remember them. Turns out if you're given a negative word, you cannot remember those associations very well at all. You're perfectly fine at remembering the non-angry words, things like kitten and things like wood, but you are not very good at remembering the angry negative words, showing perhaps that you forget or repress these memories more. Maybe. There's a similar idea here that's called suppression. Now, if you think about repression as being an automatic process, this is your brain trying to forget things because you think they're going to be harmful. Then suppression is the ego consciously making memories disappear. 
you believe or you understand a memory to be harmful, so therefore you try and get rid of it by itself. So Anderson and Green in the early 2000s find that in a very similar experiment to Levenger and Clark, if the uh, participants think of some word associations and actively try to forget others, they sometimes call this the think-no-think -think task, when they are tested later, their participants had a very poor response to the memories they consciously tried to forget. So what they are pointing out here is that suppression works equally as well as repression, except this time it's just a little bit more conscious than the repression side of things. Other evidence doesn't say so much, but it's certainly something to think about nonetheless. Big key study to think about in terms of the Freudian approach to memory is this one here. Freud, 1900, the case study of Anna O. Oh, remember, guys, that Freud very much based his, his entire theories around case studies, so it's not surprising that his thoughts on memory are similar. Basically, in the early uh, 18, well, sorry, the late 1800s, early 1900s, Freud and his colleague Breuer, Joseph Breuer, who was a, a very, very famous neuropsychologist at the time, find themselves with this young lady here. Her name they give as Anna O. Her real name is actually Bertha Pappenheim, but they give her a, a kind of a code name at the time just to preserve her anonymity. Anna O comes in and she's in a mess. She's hysterical. She's basically doing everything but frothing at the mouth. She's convulsing. She's screaming. She doesn't know where she is. She's having a really, really difficult time of it. Now, any other doctor would have you know, looked into her symptoms, but Freud is thinking, hmm, I think this is a clear-cut case of repression. There is a memory that is so painful for Anna here that it's actually bubbling up in the way that he suggested and is causing her real-life physical symptoms. So what he does is he lies her down and he talks to her. Freud called this, remember, the talking cure. He talks about her relationship with her parents. He talks about her relationship with her pets, where she grew up, what kind of aspirations she had for the future. Very, very interesting is actually what Freud finds is that Anna hates her father. And the reason that she hates her father is because her father was once desperately ill. Anna was very young when she had to deal with this, meaning she was anxious about it. She was anxious about her father dying, about her being left homeless, destitute, about being left without any money, all these different things. Now, she's not really coming to terms with that. She doesn't want to admit that she hates her father for something he has no control over. So this is why, according to Freud, she's feeling so ill because she's so anxious and this memory of her father has been repressed. Now, during Freud's treatment of her, during her psychoanalysis, Anna eventually comes to terms with that. She talks about it. She realises that she can uh, deal with it. And she gets better. That's the amazing thing about this. Not only has she come to terms with her father's illness, she suddenly physically gets better. So again, this is another um, success story for Freud. Valuation of this, however, well, first of all, this is a case study, isn't it? So is it generalizable to the world population? Probably not. But the main thing here is that critics of the time would point out that they thought that Anna might have been genuinely, desperately ill. There was a lot of meningitis around at the time. There was a lot of tuberculosis, a lot of really nasty conditions that would have made her uh, have the same symptoms. Maybe they propose that Freud takes her off the streets, he gives her a nice bed, warm clothes, he gives her um, lots of nice warm meals to eat. Maybe the very fact that he's removed her from this society, that's what made her get better. It was nothing to do with him talking to her, it was nothing to do with his psychoanalysis. It was just because he acted less as a psychologist and more as a doctor. Quite interesting to look at nonetheless. Let's evaluate the whole psychodynamic approach. I'm sure you've got a few uh, interesting thoughts about this. I'm just going to give you two here and we'll start with the negatives. Biggest thing here is even given the fact that psychoanalysis, psychodynamic uh, theory has been around for so long, hundreds of years, it still doesn't really have much research around it. Yeah, we can point out maybe Levenger and Clark and yeah, we can maybe point out Anderson and Green, but that's, to be honest, about it. Freud's thoughts are just that. They're just thoughts. They're very interesting thoughts nonetheless, but lack of empirical research means we can't really trust it. However, Freud would argue 
that these things that are being forgotten, these things that are being repressed, these are not comparable to lab experiments. You cannot incite um, childhood guilt, sexual or aggressive feelings. You cannot make people hate inside a lab, not only because it's very difficult, but also it's incredibly unethical. So Freud's theory remains pretty much untouchable. Yeah, it makes sense that there's no empirical research because we simply cannot do the research. So again, this leads us down the path of Freud's theories being a little bit unfalsifiable, but Freud would argue that his thoughts are valid because you can't test it in a lab. You just have to leave it up to him to explain away these really, really nasty, aggressive, violent or sexual memories. Look at his lovely face there. How could you say no to him anyway? Key concept here, guys. Main one is repression. If you can reliably understand repression and give me that case study of Anna O, oh, you're doing really, really well. If you go even further and remember that nice Anderson and Green study about suppression, that's even better. That's a proper A-type response there. So thanks very much, guys. That's it again for another video. Join me again next time when we're actually going to be uh, looking at different theories of memory. We'll probably start with the multi-store. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you again soon and uh, hope you enjoyed that. Cheers.